everyone. Uh, my name is Gray. I'm from this group uh, from New York City called the Cypher Collective. And we're super happy to be part of this conference. Uh, just an opportunity for us to, know, to connect with other folks and meet other things. I unfortunately did not have the opportunity to see the rest of the conference just because I don't know if you know, but things are a little crazy. But um, I, I, I missed out on, from what I hear, some really good talks. And we appreciate to be a part of that. Um, in thinking about what we were going to talk about today, what we wanted to present today as a group, um, this is kind of a weird format for us, not just the Zoom part, um, but usually we're, you know, we have workshops in person, um, or if not in person, there's like a lot of interaction, not necessarily we have to see everyone's face, but usually we can see people's faces, we can interact with them, there's one-on-one -on -one time, and there's, we try to reduce the amount that we're talking at people as much as possible. Um, so this is gonna be an interesting challenge for us because I understand we have a question and answer section at the end, but this is gonna be our version of just, this is welcome to our TED talk. We're just gonna be talking for a little bit, um, which is maybe expected for y'all because you've been part of this uh, conference for the last couple of days. But for me, it's kind of a weird thing. So we're gonna go step by step and we're gonna talk about this kind of, um, intersection of individual needs and individual safety um, and how sometimes those two are separated and where education can kind of come in at the intersection of both and maybe help close, you know, close the gap between the impression that we need to um, sacrifice things like privacy for, you know, our physical health, for example. That's a topic that's, I think, being talked about a lot right now. Um, but if, if everything's good, I'm going to just check in because I just want to get a feel. Are folks doing okay? How are you feeling? People doing okay? Yes. Good. I'm fine. Thank you, Spaco. Thanks for joining us. Um, oh, very nice. Uh, cool. Been better, but good. Completely understandable. I think that's been the, uh, my mantra for like the last couple of weeks or so, but Cool, good, so we got some goods. There's a lot of good feelings, a lot of good energy here. Um, and this should get me to my next slide. Right, welcome. So we're kind of gonna, we're kind of do kind of a couple things here. We are partly gonna go through what a usual Cypher presentation is, all the, it includes um, kind of our, our culture. And then we're gonna kind of go into the theory and the practice behind everything. One fun fact, I always include a welcome screen, but I always forget that I include a welcome screen. So it's usually here and then I remember there's a welcome screen and people get to see it for a few seconds. And it's usually hilarious, but no one gets to laugh because we go right into our overview. So um, yeah, we're just gonna talk about, I'm just gonna talk about our kind of like methodology and approach and how we think it's particularly pertinent, especially in a time like this. It was, we felt like it was pertinent. Our style um, was, was important even before the quarantine began, but even more so now for reasons that we'll we'll discuss. And so we'll kind of acknowledge current events a little bit and how they kind of play a role um, and how they affect our uh, education, basically education and workshop group. Um, and we're going to go through some of the tools that inspired us and kind of just kind of give an overview of why we do it, how we do it, where, where we came from, with the hope that um, at the end of the day, people can feel inspired to do their own crypto party, which I think is inherently the the idea behind crypto party is it's, it's DIY, it's accessible, it's approachable. Anyone can just kind of start one um, in theory. And um, we just want to promote people um, getting in cybersecurity and doing more crypto parties on their own with their own community. So if we're able to achieve one or the other today, I'm super happy. Um, if you want your money back, don't ask me, you know who to talk to. But getting into it. Who are we? So we are the, we are the, sorry, there's a, there's a work emergency happening at the same time as this meeting. And um, if I seem distracted, that's only what it is. It's not a huge deal. Emergency is kind of a, a strong word, but if I seem distracted, my apologies. So yeah, we're the Cyber Collective, just to kind of give you an overview of where we started. So we actually just celebrate our four year anniversary. And who are we? We're just really a group of volunteers. Uh, we're not you know, uh, a, uh, a business entity of any kind. We're just a group of folks that a few years ago got together and we're like, we want to learn more about cybersecurity. And we know people who want to learn more about cybersecurity. So why don't we try like 
putting together some events. And from those like few events that began in a very specific place, uh, Blue Stockings Bookstore in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which if, if you don't know is a uh, traditionally uh, feminist intersectional bookstore that has a lot of great community and activist events. And so they allowed us to um, use their space to do some of our own crypto parties. And to this day, four years later, they still let us do our monthly security, which I'll talk about in more detail later. Um, but yeah, it, and I think what was so amazing, the group started on such a good note um granted it was in the face of uh you know 2016 it was an election year similar to this one people were very concerned and very afraid of what the future was going to look like as they are now but particularly in the election and um there was just kind of more discussion activism concern and part of the activism people were concerned about like well we're using a lot of digital tools now how can we be sure that we're you know being safe that we're respecting our security culture and that we're keeping everyone in our community safe too by using or not using certain apps and myself and others had a you know similar thought we also didn't know the answer to that question per se so the group got together it was about eight people to start and i think what was the most interesting part of it it was really a mix of people who have just immense experience um and things to give the group um just from their own experience working uh, working in cybersecurity to people who would even define themselves as not really even being good at computers if you know the type of person that that says that about themselves um i'm not good at computers but i'm interested in this topic and i want to learn about it and do these workshops through it and so from the very get-go we were always trying to be accessible like both in terms of internal organizing um we needed to do topics that would make sense to some members and that would work for the more experienced members we had to kind of find a compromise but between that whole compromise we kind of found this really cool place for ourselves where we can do workshops for people who maybe aren't very good at cybersecurity um, or are very good at computers and explain it to them but also do interesting stuff for people who maybe are a little more exper experienced or who want to just learn a little bit more um, and we can kind of fill in this great beginner gap we can kind of like make this um foundation where people uh can use to maybe do their own cybersecurity research or understand their own cybersecurity needs and yeah that's that which started a few years ago sprouted into what's now three or four events a month we have a monthly cyber session uh which is our event at the Brooklyn public library every month we have a different theme uh we're looking to figure out how to do that online for may or june so we can keep that going that's been our longest program um we also have a monthly cyber social at a local venue called baby castles which is just a super awesome place to check out if i'm not sure if people where people are situated but if you're ever in new york city baby castle has some great events once a month we do a movie uh which is a lot of fun we just we're not even particularly geared toward um like a technical topic we just watch the matrix or hackers or war games and just hang out and talk about it which is kind of nice and um especially in a place like new york because there's always like well, there was always rush, 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 rush. Um, and we also hope to continue that. And of course, our monthly security, which is a unique bit of programming because it also isn't super technical. It's not a workshop per se. It's a uh, facilitated discussion at our local Blue Stockings bookstore. We sit around drinking tea um, and just talking about really our anxieties around interacting with, I don't know, the digital world, cybersecurity, really what anyone wants to bring to the table um and it's it's a feminist geared conversation which means that we keep in mind we it's important for this and all of our other events that we make a safe space for folks to feel comfortable uh speaking and talking about their own security needs and asking feeling comfortable asking questions or even pushing back against someone else and um as we'll see it it seems like as much of our work is about learning cybersecurity um as it is about almost like um uh, group therapy in a way, which has been a really interesting experience combining the two, and uh, we'll talk about that more. Um, I myself, just as a behind the scenes info, I was definitely someone who was more on the, I was okay with computers, didn't know a lot about cybersecurity, and through working with this group, I just, I learned a lot more to the point where I feel confident doing a presentation on this, doing uh, a beginner's class. Uh, I also do like beginner self-defense, physical self-defense workshops for another organization with the same idea that even a, a beginner knowledge and after years of testing it and pushing it and like learning more stuff and unlearning some stuff, um, I feel confident doing a beginner's workshop and more beginner's workshops are better because there's still a lot of people that need this information, especially 
now. Uh, this I put up because usually during our workshops, this is an example of how we set the tone and set the space. We have a safer space policy for our workshops, which is enforced is a strong word, but certainly the organizers, the Cyper folks uh, who are organizing the, a particular event, uh, bottom line, or they're responsible for kind of maintaining the temperature of the room. This is not to say that you know, we tone police or we don't, we don't allow discussion or argument or, or passion or emotion, just to say that we recognize that we want to help folks, we want to help folks, period, learn more about cybersecurity. We particularly want to help folks who have been historically uh, been pushed out of these uh, venues and spaces um, who didn't have access to this information uh, due to a number of issues pertaining to or related to their gender, sexuality, race, class. So we, yes, cool. Sorry, I just saw a comment. I'm going to turn off the comment on my end for now because I will get distracted and read them. I get very distracted easy. But, um, um, as I was saying, right, so um, just that we prioritize uh, historically marginalized identities in gaining the information with the idea that this world is not full of safer spaces. Um, this world is full of a lot of places where people are, you know, felt unwelcome. And so we want to make them feel unwelcome. And that's kind of an entryway to, to the learning process. If people don't feel welcome in our spaces, they're either going to leave or just really not retain very much because they're going to feel so nervous. So it's really important for us to set the tone and have people rely that someone is trying to set the tone uh, as best they can. Safer as, in, as opposed to safe spaces, safer because we try our best, um, you know, but um, sometimes things are beyond our control. We've had a number of situations in which uh, we've had great workshops and also some very tense, tense conversations. Uh, so that's been interesting as well. Uh, photo video, really important consent as always. And bonus rule again, try not to invalidate experiences. Uh, this is more for more so in our conversations with others in our discussions, especially when we open it up for, you know, peer to peer. Uh, I think sometimes a lot of the time, both in terms of cybersecurity education and also just kind of peer to peer advice, someone airs a grievance and, it, they, you know, they're concerned about their financial information online or they're personally being, you know, cyber stalked or cyber harassed by someone. And, you know, let's say you, you as a friend, maybe not you, but this person as a friend, um, as their friend uh, who sees them suffering in this way wants to be, wants to help. And the way that they help is by saying, Oh, have you tried downloading Signal? Um, and this is kind of an exaggeration, but it, it's that type of model where it's like, we recognize that there are um, cybersecurity solutions to, to specific problems to some extent, or we can kind of strategize and work it out. But there's definitely also an emotional aspect that we need to acknowledge to uh, cybersecurity and our feelings around it. And so we try to make sure that people just have the space to say what they need to say. Um, talk about their situation, talk about their anxieties, and it kind of informs us more as presenters what we should focus on that day and also uh, what we can focus on as a group. So fun little tidbit we do, but usually after that Safer Taste uh, slide, we talk about current events. And this is where we kind of just kind of warm up with some local, we say cybersecurity stories, but really, you know, it's, it's um, the division line between cybersecurity and like, government or economy or it's hard to separate that it's hard it's become harder and harder to separate that line so people just talk about kind of what's news on their mind and we kind of just go through it and kind of threat model a little bit we ask who are the actors who who people are concerned about um what can we do if there's anything to do and we during this process begin to introduce some of our kind of main themes of threat modeling which is a huge um model, uh, sorry, which is a huge approach for us in terms of uh, reaching out to folks who are new to the subject and helping them kind of untangle their concerns and uh, confront some of the issues that they're having with cybersecurity. Um, as well as um, the theme of harm reduction, which is something that we repeat a lot. It's, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of times people uh, get discouraged when um, they get overwhelmed or discouraged and um, when learning a new anything, whether cybersecurity or otherwise. And so it's really important for us that we have a model in which uh, we can tell people that like even a little bit every day is good enough without sounding like, 
you know, someone's parents or someone's doctors, but really say like, hey, harm reduction is important as well, right? R reducing harm. We may not ever be able to neutralize a full threat, like we, um, especially if that threat is, you know, an actor with a lot of resources, more resources than we have, but we can reduce the harm, which is like, still not the best feeling, um, but it, it's something that allows us to have agency, a little bit of agency over the situation, which can sometimes um, help people a lot through any particular situation. But current events. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you've heard, but there is a lot going on right now, um, just everywhere, just every everything is happening. I stopped watching the news regularly, maybe like a few weeks ago, just because I couldn't keep track of everything uh, going on and the context and inherently it's all related, but to go through a full list of everything that's happening would just be overwhelming to me. But some things that kind of came across our desks, there certainly has been a change of culture and it's been very um, work culture, social culture, personal culture, um, just the time that, or just the ability that people have to, to leave their house, all that has changed very quickly. And we find that a lot of these issues, which are certainly issues before quarantine, uh, whether it was phishing attacks or just wide disinformation, misinformation, um, unemployment, uh, issues with domestic violence, uh, they certainly existed before the quarantine, but now it's just become so much more pressurized. Like people, <sighs> For those who are maybe hemming and hawing about making a decision, like maybe they were someone who were like, oh, I maybe I should start using Zoom, an app like, sorry, an app like Zoom for video conferencing. I don't know. I should read their privacy policy. I should take my time with it. This situation has forced people to make that decision a little bit faster, which just goes to, sh uh, goes to say that um, some people are still, the way we like to see it is right now, there's people who are still like, nervous and want to learn a lot about cybersecurity and how to educate edu educate themselves on their cybersecurity needs. But there's also people who have made the decision already to either prioritize or not prioritize cybersecurity. And sorry, just catching my train of thought. And so I, I think it's for us as educators, our group, it's really interesting to kind of intervene, not just for those who want to learn more, but to those who maybe have already made a decision about what their priorities are. And it's important for us. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, some of our, our usual, uh, some of our usual, um, I don't wanna say barriers, but challenges to the educational process is, you know, we have a few different types of people come in. Um, there's people coming in who are anxious because coming into our workshops because they, they heard a thing on social media or maybe someone told them and they're not sure if it's true and whether or not they themselves believe in the thing, whether or not they act upon it and, and you know, change their lives because of it. There's a lot of anxiety around disinformation, misinformation, because we just don't know who to trust. And that's still an ongoing question. Um, we don't always point people to specific sources. Um, depending on their uh, situations, because it's, um, sorry, works up. Um, let me start that again. We just think it's very important that uh, the trust people develop isn't so much in very specific sources, but in their ability to read between the lines or look through the privacy policy or just kind of like second guess the source a little bit. Um, of course, there's uh, some denial where people come in with. And when I say that, I don't mean to say that in a judgmental way. I mean, just simply in the way that our brains um, to, the, to defend ourselves. Uh, sometimes we gotta just deny something, which for me is, is uh, at least I interpret it, is kind of a process really of also prioritization, which say that we're concerned about two very important things at once. We only have the resources or time to, um, acknowledge or face one of those threats and sometimes the thing that helps us make the decision is by denying or kind of like reducing the perceived threat of 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 the threat and we see that both in the workshop outside of the workshop i think within the workshop it mostly comes out as a um i'm not sorry quite da -da 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 -da. sorry 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 Um, 
Right. So denial and priorities, maybe those are two subjects that are probably um, better put together. Just say that our challenge isn't so much that people have other priorities. Um, I think when, if we've, as educators in our group, ever been frustrated with people for like not following particular cybersecurity advice or having that advice, I don't think it's ever from a place of uh, really saying that people, I mean, people should prioritize cybersecurity more, but how much of that is um, of their own agency. And so us, us questioning that. So rather than putting the onus solely on the, um, the attendee for changing their ways, for prioritizing things, we acknowledge that people have their priorities. Priorities are very important. Um, I give the example sometimes, like let's say you're someone that has works a double shift, 12 hours a day, five days a week, which is maybe even more, maybe you work three or four jobs, who's to say, which is not uncommon in this economy. Um, you come home at the end of the day exhausted because you just faced a whole day of stuff that gives you worry. And I just don't find it very likely that that person would care about something like going through all their passwords and making sure all their passwords are correct and safe. Not because they don't think it's important, but because there's just only so much energy in a day, in a week. And when other things are taking our focus, some things get left by the wayside, which is understandable. So denial and priorities in the sense we want to acknowledge it. Uh, we don't want to, well, in response to those challenges, um, instead of talking at folks or talking down to folks or really coming off as we're trying to command folks, um, even though we do feel like we have the correct information, um, we want to just kind of be there to, in a supportive space, to just kind of suggest to kind of talk it out with the other person and, and support them in, you know, whatever they decide uh, to do in the sense that if, uh, you know, we've had a couple attendees that are, you know, returned to us and, you know, every month they're like, okay, I tried this thing. What do you think I should try next? We tell them we should try next, they come back next month. So there's that kind of building of community through just uh, being supportive of their efforts and also being uh, flexible about means and strategies and also just um, really the time it takes for people to kind of come around to prioritizing their own privacy in general, but also cybersecurity a little bit more. Uh, and what uh, inspired us really early on, so we needed a model, right, that would acknowledge cybersecurity, be flexible enough to so that our uh, that our um, advice and recommendations would change because uh, as situations change, as context change, because things change really fast, especially uh, in the digital world. So we need something that was flexible that we can kind of learn about that we didn't necessarily all need a degree to to teach, um, and one that would also keep in mind the other priorities an individual might have when going about their life, when thinking about their safety as a whole. And so we found this great uh, book, um, Tactical Tech Collective, which I'm sure some folks here know about. We can't, uh, we can't talk about them enough. They have such great learning materials, especially for beginners. Um, a couple of us went to their, um, they had an art exhibition, the, their data detox art exhibition that they had a few years ago. Uh, I came to New York, New York City, and we went to it and we were very much inspired. And it was almost like, it was, it was, it felt like, proselytizing. I say that as someone that came from a religious background, so so no, no shade there, absolutely. But I like I, I got there, they gave me a book, and I was just like, oh, this is so great. It, it had that process, though it wasn't wasn't pushy. They're very nice folk. They, uh, they're not a cult, is what I'm suggesting. They're not. And um, yeah, this book just kind of gave us a bit of a framework. Um, I'm just going to read a section here, um, just to because I think they, the words here are better than anything I'm about to say. But starting at well-being as subversive and political. So holistic security, what is holistic security? The holistic approach frames security for human rights defenders as well as, as well-being in action, being physically and emotionally healthy and sustaining ourselves while continuing to do the work that we believe in. In order to protect ourselves from the threats our well -being, to our well-being posed by stress, fatigue, trauma, and grief, among other things, we have to engage consciously and deliberately with the idea of self-care. Self-care should not be understood, uh, should, be under, should not be understood not Ooh, that's their title. Self-care should not be understood not a selfish act, not as a selfish act, but rather as a subversive and political act of self-preservation. Uh, and this book, uh, in addition to just being available for free online, um, there was a great uh, training of trainers component where they had a separate book to take this model and apply it through exercises and presentations. 
And in addition to, you know, a lot of other stuff that makes a cyber, um, whether it's the, uh, the, the volunteerism, the horizon, horizontality, we're a very horizontal collective, um, very politically motivated corrective, uh, collective, um, very harm, harm reduction with a harm reduction approach. Holistic security has also helped us uh, frame and explain to people at the very least their options instead of telling them what they need to do now, rather what we, what could they do now? What could they do keeping in mind everything else that might be going on in their life? And so this is kind of the, the chart that they have. Basically the, the idea behind holistic security, just to kind of summarize the book a little bit is that when we think about our safety and our security as individuals, uh, cybersecurity is certainly part of it, but it's certainly not the only part of it. And our physical security, our psychosocial, uh, mental, emotional health is important in acknowledging this too. And I'm sure there is like a, there's a, I would say more bootstrap approach that works for some people, which is like, this is the subject matter and these are my feelings and I'm gonna, I have the ability to separate the two. So I'm just gonna focus on this and separate from that. A lot of people don't uh, necessarily have that option for a lot of reasons. And uh, we found that we were able to talk to people a little bit easier when we acknowledge that like, hey, yeah, you have a whole life, you have a family, you have other issues, or you have threats outside of the cyber world, or you have threats in the cyber world that are affecting you emotionally and physically. Um, and all those things need to be acknowledged because when we make a security plan, if we were only focused on the cybersecurity, we, we might end up with a lot of people with big lists of apps to download and things to try and, and definitely a lot to learn, but there's also this chance that they might get burnt out or uh, overwhelmed by all the new information coming in at once. Um, we, I like to use this example. Um, cybersecurity as an educational field, like any other educational field, is very interesting um, because, you know, let's say when you learn a language, uh, like let's say you learn Spanish, uh, you don't necessarily have people going into Spanish classes and saying things like, um, I just need the top five, sorry, this is a reverse image. So I just need the top five or top 10 Spanish words, the most important Spanish words I can use, and I'm good to go. And I'm sure you can think of maybe 10 words that are maybe more used and more important. And I'm sure there are things to say, there's advice to give. Uh, just like with us, we can definitely give people like a top, 10 list, which can be super helpful, like, a, you know, bytes can be very helpful for people. But just like language, if you want to learn the grammar and the context and kind of really get a full understanding and the art uh, behind the language, um, it's important that, yeah, it's important that we create a space in which people feel comfortable coming to staying at so they are there enough time to hear about the full context and things. Um, and th that comes straight from this kind of holistic security model and idea, some other graphs. So just um, some other cool things that images, um, this kind of uh, uh, understanding how people perceive threat. Um, I think we might know how we individually perceive threat, but sometimes, you know, when thinking about another person, um, we might just not understand why someone is worried about something as much or as little as they are. And that's just to kind of get into the the, uh, the subjectivity and the, the the personal nature of safety and threat. Um, I'm sure maybe many of you have worked in groups where really any conflict, but we can think in a cybersecurity setting, um, I'm really bad at coming with examples on the spot. So let's say you had a disagreement, uh, let's say you're an activist group and one person in the group, you're planning, um, a barbecue and you're concerned about, let's say state surveillance. One person is concerned about state surveillance. Let's say they send someone over to record or have some kind of infiltration. To another person in that group, their response to that is, no, uh, I don't think that's likely, not a big deal. So let's not think about it. Uh, you know, in, in a way to both kind of acknowledge the person, they also shut down the conversation. And I don't know about you, but if I, I've very rarely been in a situation where someone told me, don't worry about it. And I stopped worrying about it. In fact, I worry about it twice as much. And so it's, helping us acknowledge that people perceive the same threat many different ways. And there's a lot of different reasons behind it. It doesn't mean that someone with, um, you know, below this eye line is, is uncaring or doesn't care. They just probably have a lot of, you know, like anyone else probably have a lot of stuff going on uh, so that they don't have time to uh, like research all the different types of VPNs and their privacy policies and which ones are better. There's some great lists out there for sure. 
Um, but just, what I'm saying is just kind of getting into a new subject matter. And starting with that approach, we then go into just kind of um, helping the participant tease out what the threat is. Sometimes the overwhelming nature of the thought of a threat um, could be enough to have people you know, ignore it or deny it or just not address it, which is everyone's prerogative for sure. Um, but if we're, I guess, showing people ways of how they can address threats, it's helpful for, for us to take what their perception of threat is, whether it's some of the big things people talk about are like state, I wish I had pop-up things like state, corporate, um, peer-to-peer. Let's say take state or corporate, for example. Those are some big threats. And even within those, um, sorry, those are some uh, quite, uh, okay, yeah. Those are some big, and okay, there we go. Those are some big entities uh, to have um, against you as an opponent. There's just a lot of resources. Um, but there's also an importance in kind of like splitting up and taking apart when someone says they're afraid of uh, corporations selling their data, or someone says they're afraid of state surveillance, uh, it could be an opportunity to have a conversation about like a specific type of actor within those. So for example, the state can encompass uh, police and government and uh, the people who pick up the garbage. And like what, like, what is the state? When you talk about the state, what are you thinking of? So to be able to add more words to the feeling of threat by organizing in this way, in this case, um, holistic security has this great spectrum of allies, um, which is kind of a nice way of putting it. Because when we think about threats, solely negative, spectrum of allies, people who are opponents, yes, but also we have some allies too. And this kind of exercise helps us imagine that active allies, uh, allies, neutral parties, and of course, opponents and strong opponents. For example, there might be for um, one politician who is a strong opponent active opponent against a piece of legislation and there might be other uh, politicians who are maybe neutral to it or allies and this kind of helps you know how to address the issue who to approach it's good to know who you have on your side in addition to thinking all the time about who is against you um, as fun as that is uh, it also causes a lot of anxiety uh, and ultimately we have people visualize not just the individual threat, but the maybe collection of threats that they or their organization uh, perceive as dangerous. Um, and we, we split up the idea because I think the, the overwhelming nature of even like starting a new organization or starting an organization that uh, deals in like a politically active context, there's a, there's a lot of things to consider when considering uh, security. There's physical security for sure, but there's also like emotional burnout from doing the work and cybersecurity. There's just so many, how do we communicate on the phone? How do we communicate on the computer? What if there's a document? There's a lot of stuff to share. There's a lot of different things to figure out when you start something new. And certainly even when you're, um, have been part of organization, there's always new stuff coming and succumbing, sometimes multiple things at once. And so we like this particular exercise from holistic security because um, it allows folks to, on their own, uh, as individuals decide what to them is more likely, less likely, what's more uh, impactful to them and what's less impactful. And of course it gives them space to say that they don't, they're not sure. It's okay to say you're not sure and to kind of learn more about the threat or assess the threat more. And we like this model because it's, it's inherently subjective, just like again, security is, and it allows people to just kind of make their own plan. Maybe you have something high impact, high likelihood that you want to take care of first before something that's low impact, low likelihood. And I think just saying that out loud, um, people, people can say it's like, oh yeah, no, of course you, you deal with the, the most important thing first. But I think for some people, especially with me, I'm, I'm someone with a lot of anxiety. Um, sometimes things get jumbled up and they seem about the same. Um, and so visualizing and the discussion that goes with this particular form of threat modeling helps us kind of helps us help the person kind of suss out what their concern is and what can they do today um, and what can they plan on doing in the in the long term to assess, um, confront this threat. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, we're nearly at the end. Again, this is a lot of talking for me. I haven't, I don't usually do this much talking. Um, I feel like 
last time I did it, it was in college or in high school. And uh, it's just it's just a weird way for me to communicate. And um, but I, you know, thank everyone for staying along as they have. Um, and yeah, so I think kind of getting back to what makes Cypress special. So we kind of have our <sighs> We have, you know, we have our we have our motif. We have our safe spaces. We have our approach to harm reduction. We have these tools that we're going to talk about with some links uh, in a second. Some recommendations of tools that really inspired us over the years. Um, in fact, actually, one thing I forgot to mention, just to pop back to the very beginning, it's almost like this was the uh, smoking gun. Um, things like putting an expiration date on our presentations isn't to say that we are confident that this will be wrong in six months. It's uh, just the idea that this information, especially around threat is always ever changing. So we promote that people look into it themselves in a few months to see if that information is still applicable. We can also be available for folks to check in with us. And that's something we actually got from, uh, if folks know Matt Mitchell, uh, who does a lot of stuff, but we know him through Crypto Parley Harlem, which does a lot of really great accessible community workshops on cybersecurity um inspired us in our work a lot and that's where we got that from so just as an example so out of all of our things i think the most important values that kind of guide us um through our workshops and also our monthly planning sessions where we kind of get together and talk about what we want to do the next month or what we feel like doing um collaboration super important again just the idea that we want to respect that the person coming into our workshop space we want to try to lessen the amount of difference between us um, as educators and participants as much as possible. We don't want to feel people, we don't want people to feel like they're being condescended to or talked down to, or that we know more or, th or th I think the worst thing, if people just do everything that we tell them to do, everyone will be safe. And if they don't do it, then that's their loss. It's it's about collaboration. It's about understanding the participant's subjectivity. It's also understanding that everyone, again, has their own safety and threat model. And that person, whether they know it or not, they are the master of their own threat model, whether that's cybersecurity related, physical, emotional, otherwise, they know the situation best because they've lived it. Starting from there, um, so collaboration, accessibility, uh, making sure that our workshops are accessible, both uh, financially, all of our workshops are free. We just kind of work on by donation. Uh, but also that our stuff is is visual and friendly and fun. And we really try to focus on the interactive so that we can get folks thinking. We play a lot of like red versus blue games. Uh, one of our current members was particularly good at writing scenarios. I think they, they're, you know, a fledgling uh, dungeon, dungeon master. They can write up some great scenarios uh, for some uh, red versus blue games. And people had a lot of fun and they learned, um, they learned a lot about the subject and the subject area through that interaction. So making sure that people can show up to our events that they can stay at our events that they can feel comfortable at our events it's it's a lot of certainly emotional labor and again we're not saying that everyone has to do this to have good cybersecurity workshops and events and discussions with people it's just um we've kind of reached the limit of how much we can teach um solely by talking about like this is a signal. This is what PGP means. This is what VPN is. Do you know what Tor is? And in our fourth year, or rather in our fifth year, um, really kind of intervening with folks um, at an like a at a really at an emotional point in the educational process, um, and just kind of you know being there or just showing them the options that they could have even if we can't like be there for them 24 7 we're not um promising to like um be behind people all the time now after they come to our workshops you know but um that they feel like they can come back and they feel like it's a space for them because especially a lot of folks who come again to our workshops they don't feel like they have a lot of space for themselves in tech in cybersecurity. They just don't see themselves in there, and so they don't go to those events. Um, intersectionality, super important part of our work, just the idea that forms of oppressions interconnect, and um, it's just acknowledged. It's important to acknowledge those intersections uh, for any individual or the potential problems that having uh, multiple intersections in a, an oppressive society um, 
the the repercussions that could have on an individual and their security model and their threat model and being flexible talking it out being flexible with it i think being flexible with you know feeling like we don't know everything and so we are the experts of everything we're very much learning and continuing to learn things um our group is a super interesting one again just to kind of brag about it just because i have a little time left it's um it's very fluid people come people go people get what they need from it and then you know move on or they move and they still stay a part of it it's very much a, a friendly volunteer group and it's been through so many iterations um the first eight that i described earlier uh that went down to three kind of fast and then it stayed at three now it's back up to five then back down to four so our our numbers vary our numbers vary we are a legion um our numbers vary but um the we've had really good luck by putting these uh, ethics out there by getting people to come through to our presentations and also into our um, working group uh, who also find these values important in their own life in cybersecurity and education or otherwise uh, and yeah the i don't know when we decided to up the the cat cat propaganda or cat propaganda if you will but um it's become a mainstay of our brand so we have a lot of cats i don't know if you're looking for a particular reason on the cats uh we just like cats is, does there need to be any more reason but thank you for watching um oh i mixed up the order of these things sorry almost done finishing up i'm not sure if you're this is my you're talking my my talking time the music you're, are you playing the music to uh no okay no. cool Okay, let me finish up right quick. So yeah, cybersecurity, our crypto parties are very much on part cyber and very much collaboration. If you leave with anything, that's kind of a special sauce. And of course, a little meow there as well. Um, and yeah, just acknowledge you, um, take care of yourself, acknowledge your own uh, emotional needs as well as digital security, digital security concerns. Slow down when you can, notice scarcity mindset. That can be harder said than done now that we're in the middle of a situation as opposed to, um, getting ready for a situation. Uh, but hopefully through our workshops and the other kind of online workshops and conferences happening during this period, people kind of can start feeling a bit more comfortable in this quarantine period, quarantine era. Um, quick for the resources, just gonna write down right quick. Cyber NYC is our website. We have a lot of our old presentations in our GitHub there, as well as our calendar of events that we're trying to update right now. Close security, as I mentioned, by Tactical Tech Collective. Check out Tactical Tech. They have a lot of great intro. If you know someone in your life that's like, I don't know where to begin cybersecurity, Tactical Tech has some great uh, tools for people to use. The EFF Security Education Companion, as full disclosure, we are part of the EFA, the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is a group of uh, cybersecurity-minded organizations and privacy-minded organizations around the United States that are kind of organized by the EFF to just, yeah, share resources and talk. And as part of it, they, um, interviewed us for the security education companion a few years back. So some of our thoughts and words are in it, but it's also just kind of a great guide for people getting into cybersecurity education um, to kind of get an understanding of how to approach people, how to talk about topics. And uh, of course, Crypto Party, the website, check it out if you haven't, uh, Crypto Party Harlem. And as, as I mentioned, not as active at the moment, but uh, I think if you go to their meetup, they have some uh, backlogged events maybe with some presentation material as well if you want to check that out and i don't know why i threw that in i think i was just tired Ped pedagogy of the oppressed some of us in our group have read it some have started and uh couldn't finish but um yeah if you want to know a little more about our kind of uh, educational foundations uh, it's very much influenced by this kind of um anarchistic educational model um and i think that's it and i can take a breath for now, and I'm gonna take it back to Sean because I don't know what's gonna happen next. And uh, let me put it back to the slide. Thanks for watching. Awesome, well, thank you for that. Um, and I, I love the cats, so you don't need to. Uh... <laughs> Great. <laughs> sure, so, um, you know, obviously uh, a lot of folks uh, around the country are doing crypto party type, whether they know it's a crypto party or not, but I think usually that's, that's what people call it sort of um they do those activities i used to do a ton of them uh, we used to do a ton of them for privacy lab um, we still do them occasionally but usually focused mm -hmm. on one or two tools very specifically um so i think in, in a lot of ways uh you're 
you, the collective, are on to something with um, trying to make sure it's not just a list of tools, um, right. which is really important, and obviously makes it so you're tailoring to the uh, to the audience much better. Um, sort of on that, you know, one of the challenges I've always faced is, um, you know, going down through a concept of um, privacy, especially, but security, you know, the two things are obviously correlated. Um, right folks can come away with it or you know halfway through the presentation or towards the tail end of the presentation um as being like well i might as well just throw my hands up you know that's sort of nihilistic right. um i used to call it surveillance fatigue um because i think it can be a slow process too um how do you all deal with that what's your response when somebody's like why should i even try to protect myself from anything right yeah the um that's a that's a good question. That's a really big question. That's one that I personally think about a lot just for, for this and other um, projects that I do. Um, it's 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 weird. We're we're not a we're not a super this might not be the right word, like aggressive group. Like we don't um, we don't necessarily go into spaces where we're not invited. So we have kind of that look of when we have an event and we manage people's expectations about what the event's gonna be like and what they can learn from it. We tend to get people who are like into this idea of cybersecurity or at the very least interested in learning more. So through just the way we promote ourselves uh, and the way we communicate with people, uh, we tend to avoid a lot of those conversations in the events themselves. But certainly a lot of people come to us talking about, you know, people in their lives um, um, saying that they don't, um, that, talking about people in their lives who don't respect their own cybersecurity and threat modeling needs and don't respect those of others saying things like, well, if I didn't do anything wrong, then why should, you know, the, the, the stuff, the stuff that I think a lot of these conferences try to like take apart and talk about. And um, we, I guess we try, and I feel like if we approach that kind of nihilism, as you said, or, or denial uh, with our own denial, um, two denials, you know, don't make a right. I guess they're just not in our experience. It's, we try to our best and this is, you know, we're not experts, we're not professionals. None of us are psychiatrists or PhDs, we're just people. We try our best to find the truth in what they're denying and kind of focus on talking about that. Because again, they're, the, the thing that they're denying, the thing that they're ignoring, the thing that they're devaluing or prioritizing about their cybersecurity might be just this kind of big bundle of concerns that might have 30 different social and also very personal topics that we certainly can't broach in a in a crypto party um and so it's necessarily not our place to get to know everyone uh, as if we are their psychiatrists but just to give people the benefit of the doubt and kind of understand that they yeah this is the conclusion they made we respect that this is where we disagree or this is where we think you can kind of like amend that to again harm reduction a lot of people get behind the idea of harm reduction um i feel like it's kind of comforting it's, as opposed to this idea of perfection that we have to do everything right to have good security or good cyber security or just good personal security. Um, the harm reduction approach just gives people a chance to be like, I have messed up, I will mess up, but if I do a little bit every day, it's better than throwing my hands up and doing nothing at all. So we, we, I guess we try to keep it kind of positive, but that's that's our approach to that. So uh, you mentioned, obviously, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is a really important uh, book and also um, example um, to talk about education and uh, how it can be done differently, I think, than, than what most people are used to. Um, could you tell us a little more about how that sort of informs um, decision making for the collective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I regret bringing it up because, again, I was the person that read through the introduction. And I, I remember the introduction because I think in the introduction it said that uh, I was having trouble reading through it's a very it's an academic book at least for me it is um it takes it takes time to read it and in the introduction there was like a um a phrase from the author saying you know don't look down on people in the third world saying that oh they won't be able, able to understand this text because it resonates with their own with their own life and their own experiences and i'm like true um but I'm in, you know, so-called United States, and I, I still don't understand this. So I don't think I'm going to understand the past introduction, so I'm going to put it down for now. But it's, um, it was, it's part pedagogy of the oppressed. It's part because, you know, our collective doesn't have a specific political bent. Um, like we can't say we're all socialists, all anarchists, all the time, 100. Um, percent 
Uh, certainly we are on the left side of the spectrum and certainly we have been influenced by a lot of members who are anarchists, have become anarchists. We, it's funny enough, we tend not to ter talk about like personal politics a lot, but people tend to agree with this idea, whether we call it horizontality or collaboration, people understand the, the idea and the need for making space um, for as many people as possible in a particular situation because the group and the community can survive better by listening to the thoughts and feel and threats of, of others rather than ignoring them and just kind of pushing past them. It just makes uh, for a stronger, uh, makes for a stronger group. People feel comfortable talking and speaking their minds. We can brainstorm a lot easier. People feel heard. And the result being that we become better presenters or workshop organizers or educators because we can, um, yeah, just work with folks in their particular situation instead of trying to make everyone work in our paradigm or sure. of, of things we see important. Um, so that's the best thing I can say that for, there's definitely other members in our group who have read the book and can speak to it a lot better than I can. But uh, but yeah, Pedagogy of the Press, it's a great read. I'm still trying to get through it, but it's, it's not a bad read, it's a great read. Very cool stuff. Um, so I'm gonna do a question from the chat here and I'd encourage everybody to fill in a question if you have a question for Gray uh, that you would like me to ask. Um, so the question is, I work with a group of women who are involved in stopping gun violence. They are regularly attacked online and cyber stalked. They are now using WIRE, with a capital W, to communicate privately, but they still are on Facebook, Twitter, and go to public protests. What I'm interested in is, how can we help them follow up on their threats, uh, on the threats that they get online? Sorry, I heard that, but I'm also just kind of rereading it for details. Sure. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a particularly tough threat model. We know a few folks who are very public, have public personas because they're journalists or academics or what have you. They have public personas uh, and have very controversial thoughts or do kind of what's considered controversial things. And so, what do you do with that threat model for someone who needs to be public? Certainly, I can't tell them get off Twitter, uh, get off social media, because that's their, in a way that's their bread and butter. That's the way to communicate with the world, which is, is an important part of free expression and what they do. So um, in this type of situation, I'm interested in having Gavin call off on Thursday, got online. I think again, just kind of looking at our, mon our model or is this as an example, this is, kind of a regular example of stuff we get at our, for example, our security workshop, people come with these issues about like, how do I, can I make space for myself in this world? When every time I try to make space for myself, um, something really negative happens. And um, we do the cybersecurity stuff. I, like we do talk about, you know, looking into Facebook and Twitter settings and going through that step by step with the person to kind of help them see what agency they have, even when using uh, these corporate tools. Um, we try to stay away from the kind of like ultimate, like get off all social media all the time. It's just not, there's a lot more for me to say that, but it's just for us, it's not plausible, certainly all the time, not for everyone. And so, yes, can you talk about the, so, uh, pause not to out them is a, on the chat, on the public chat is a separate person. And so uh, what they're talking about, they, they said, uh, can you talk to them what their needs are? Maybe that's a way to open up a conversation. And that's inherently the other element of what we do. We just brainstorm and we just make sure that we're, yes, absolutely. So I'm sorry, I saw Mark's point. Um, we just make sure that we create an environment in which people feel comfortable, you know, teasing these ideas out. These are uncomfortable ideas. Um, addressing them in itself can be a brave act and can be a very important thing. It could take all your day's energy just to think about it for an hour or half an hour. Um, but if, but even if just like five minutes a day, whatever intervention that is, whether it's actually learning a new tool, learning a new method, or just discussing it, or talking about ways to address it in the future, um, just especially if there's someone that you know and they're maybe their their friends or colleagues or someone you you know care a lot about, following up and checking in. Uh, not in like a, in a pedantic or um, top-down kind of way, condescending way, but just checking in as you would any friend 
see how they're doing, see what there's on their minds. We found that's really helpful, especially for people who feel isolated um, online or, or in person, just having a space where people can be like, this worries me, can be super useful. Yeah, no, I agree. And, uh, you know, one of the things I always say is you're not going to free yourself uh, all at once. You're going to free yourself in pieces. It's a process, right? Um, so it's very important, I think, to recognize that these other platforms exist, that um, people need to organize in a lot of ways uh, on these platforms to sort of meet people where they're at. Right. Um, and then that has inherent risks, unfortunately, like, you know, people stalking and doing all kinds of other obnoxious, terrible things. So, yeah. Try to arm yourself the best you can, right? But it's it's not easy. There, there definitely is not one answer to that. Um, yeah. Just uh, before we go here, and, and, and I think um, for me, uh, uh, this is the question that's going to be interesting going forward for everybody during the pandemic and also maybe after. You know, um, the landscape has sort of shifted under our feet uh, mm -hmm. in the last, definitely in New York City. I mean, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, yeah, it's very strange. And a lot of things yeah. are being accelerated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the advice we give is going to change, but I also think the medium is. Obviously, we're talking now online um, in, in a, a pretty big chat room here, basically, with video and slides. Um, is that kind of thing, uh, that delivery method, is that something you think um, you are going to need going forward? Uh, do you feel that it detracts at all from the in-person sort of events? Um, and what do you think? Uh, I don't know. What do you think about it in general? Yeah, uh, just a, just a couple of things, and to, I'm going to make sure not to talk too much about it because uh, this this is also a very good question. Um, simply saying hello, simply saying um, whether it was for for this group for Cyper or for my other group, uh, just a little plug. Pop gym. We do free self defense workshops around New York City and otherwise. When this thing first started, we yeah we like the personal approach. We like the in person approach. Um, and it, we were kind of like hemming and hawing about how we should continue forward. But this does seem to be the, the new normal for now. And we still want to reach out to people and have these spaces, whether it's, if it's not online, if it's not in, in person, then at the very least online, again, just every little bit can be so important. So whether we do these with video, with audio, without video, without audio, there's going to be so many creative ways I think people are going to develop uh, online presenting, whether through Zoom or with the new apps that are created. Um, I'm just kind of looking forward to see what options become available to simplify the education process through video conferencing uh, as we go forward. Um, see, I have problems with UIs and these things still. Um, thank you so much. And uh, yes. that was that was really wonderful. And uh, I'll make sure uh, any comments, you know, that uh, are directed for you guys, uh, you get them and stick around, please. This was really great. One last plug. Sorry. Yep. Go for uh, it. Sorry, just one, us one more time again, Cyper NYC. If you have any questions, uh, Cyper at protonmail.com is our email. And of course, I just want to thank, uh, I've presented for the last hour, but this was a collaboration for the last two weeks with a lot of cool Cyper people. So I want to acknowledge them and thank you for your uh, advice and support and emotional support. And y'all are great. Uh, but yeah, thanks for having us. And we'll maybe catch you at a Cyper event.